business, research, and technology programs. Some senators have vowed to block all legislation not dealing with the federal budget. Live coverage of the U.S. Senate now here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, we praise you because of your righteousness and lift our hearts in adoration to you, the King Most High. Poor eternity, into these brief lives of ours and use us for your glory. Lift our lawmakers to the heights of noble living, renewing them with your hope and strengthening them with your power. Lord, show them how to make wise use of their days to become the people they ought to be and to do the things that make for peace in our nation and world. May their highest motive be not to win over one another, but to win with one another by doing your will. And Lord, we ask that you would sustain the victims of the seismic devastation in Japan. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., March 14, 2011, to the Senate, under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3, of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Christopher A. Coons, a senator from the state of Delaware, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Mr. President. Forgive me. <laughs> Mr. President, following any later remarks, there will be a period of morning business until 4.30 p.m. Senators will be allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each. At 4.30, the Senate will proceed to executive session. To consider the nomination of count number 10, the nomination of James Bosberg, the District of Columbia, the United States District Judge for the District of Columbia. There will be up to an hour of debate, equally divided prior to vote on that nomination. Senators should expect two roll call votes at 5.30 today. That will be in relation to the confirmation of James Bosberg and cloture on the motion to proceed to S-493, the Small Business Reauthorization Act of 2011. Concurrent, the current continuing resolution expires this Friday. We expect the House to send us a three-week CR on Tuesday or Wednesday. We hope we can work out an agreement to consider the bill before the end of this week. Mr. President, my thoughts and those of the entire nation and certainly every member of the United States Senate with the people of Japan. The earthquake that shook that nation has made the entire world tremble, and the tsunami that swept over its shores has engulfed us all with grief. We're really heartbroken at the images we've seen and the stories we've heard. We share the agony of the families who have lost loved ones and the anguish of those who are still searching for the missing. The earthquake, tsunami, and subsequent catastrophes have created a humanitarian crisis of the first order. And the United States will do everything we can to ease Japan's pain and help it heal. 
As the devastation rescue efforts both continue, we know Japan and the world will meet this tragedy with tenacity and will respond to the immense loss with immeasurable hope. This dreadful disaster is not stronger than the people of Japan's resolve to recover and rebuild, and it's no match for America's determination to help a friend in need. Mr. President, it's really difficult to think of the Senate's business at such a time as this. But we must. It's difficult to think of the Senate's business after hundreds of thousands of lives have been forever changed in an instant. Every matter seems immaterial in comparison. And our use of the adjective emergency when discussing budget concerns seems so misplaced. But we must also focus on the business of our great country. And that's what the Senate will do this week. I hope both parties and both houses will find the courage to come together before the weekend on a plan to fund the country. I remind my Republican colleagues once again that this Friday's deadline is one that they set. We didn't. We asked for four weeks to work, and they demanded two weeks. They asked for March 18th. March 18th awaits us at the other end of this week. So it's time to really get serious. Last week, budget votes proved what we've been saying throughout this negotiation. We must meet in the middle. The distance between Democrats and Republicans is not measured in money only. I regret to report that so far, we remain far more divided on the willingness to compromise. Democrats have made it crystal clear that we're determined to pass a budget. We recognize the reality that one party alone will not reach a resolution without the other party's cooperation and consent. We've accepted and acknowledged that we need to share that sacrifice. Democrats are willing to find reasonable ways to do that, and we've offered necessary cuts that will strengthen our future rather than weaken our future. But we're still waiting for the Republicans to do the same. They're pretending last week's votes didn't happen. They're covering their eyes and ears to the reality that their proposal, the short-sighted bill the Tea Party and the Republicans and the House of Representatives continue to support, it was roundly rejected here in the Senate. We're still waiting for them to bring something, anything now to the table. And not only something, but something new. They haven't done that yet. Listen to the Republican speeches and sound bites, and you'll hear no reasonable cuts, no serious offer, no willingness to compromise, and no sense of shared responsibility. You'll hear no new ideas. We can't afford another week of these games. We cannot negotiate through the media, and we cannot negotiate if one side is unwilling to give any ground. We can't keep funding the country a couple weeks at a time. How many times have we heard our Republican friends decry uncertainty, claiming that it hurts job creation and worries the markets. How quickly they've forgotten their own advice. So, Mr. President, it's time to leave. On this point, Democrats have been very clear. I hope a solution is at hand. But if no budget passes, we cannot keep the country running. We'll be clear which side will bear that burden. This week, we'll also start debating a jobs bill, another jobs bill. We did the FAA bill. We did the patent bill. That's, we're told by the experts, that's almost 600,000 jobs. The job we're going to take up now will help small businesses do what American businesses do best, imagine, innovate, and invent. The bill we'll soon discuss will support a research and development program that has helped tens of thousands of small businesses create jobs and shape the future since President Reagan started this program three decades ago. These investments work. They've helped get new ideas off the ground. Everything from the electric toothbrush to satellite antenna that helped our first responders in Haiti to technology that keep our food safe and our military tanks from overheating in the desert. One company in Carson City, Nevada, has used this small business innovation program to support a technology that helps firefighters reach people on the highest floors of burning buildings. Another Nevada company from Henderson, Nevada, has developed an advanced rechargeable battery that our troops are using in the field. There are success stories like this in every state because of this legislation that was enacted initially almost 30 years ago. Small businesses are the laboratories of visionaries who create jobs and cultivate ideas. We, in turn, must help these businesses grow and succeed. That's what this week's bill will do. Finally, Mr. President, let me say something briefly about gas prices. 
This budget debate has shown a stark contrast between our nation's serious challenges and the lack of bipartisan agreement on serious solutions. The same is true when it comes to energy. Drivers across the country are watching gas prices go up and up and up. They're worried about how expensive it is to drive to work every morning or pick up their kids from school or just even get to the grocery store and back. It's really a serious challenge. But I'm disappointed, Mr. President, that the Republicans refuse to join us in offering a serious solution. We know why gas prices are going up. First, the Middle East nations from which we import the vast majority of oil are in turmoil. That hurts production and exports. Second, OPEC and greedy investors control a widely speculative market. And third, big oil cannot quench its thirst for record profits and it will pursue them at any cost to the consumer. The Republican reflex is a replay of the same script we've seen time and time and time again. The Republican reflex is to demand more drilling, as if that will instantly ease the price at the pump. It's an easy argument to make. It will nicely line the pockets of their friends in big oil. It sounds simple, but as a solution to high gas prices, it's plain fiction. Here's a little known fact. The United States produced more oil in 2009 than in any year since 2003. So for all the right wings finger pointing at President Obama, it's worth noting that we've drilled more oil since President Obama has been in office. In fact, when President Bush was in the White House, field production of crude oil dropped every single year. And in his last year in office, prices and oil company profits rose to record heights. So let's retire the tired talking point that President Obama is sitting on the solution. In fact, it's those same big oil companies that are quite literally sitting on that oil that Republicans demand. Big oil is sitting on more than 60 million acres of federal land and water that they have leases that they have the right to drill on. That means nearly 20% of our nation's oil refining capacity sits idle. They have shown more interest in making profits than in making oil. But let's pretend for a minute that they did do the drilling. Even if big oil drilled on all its offshore leases, it would have no impact on the price of gasoline during the whole decade, the next decade. By 2030, it might lower those prices by three cents a gallon. And that's not my calculation. It comes from the Energy Information Agency. Let's not forget the big picture. The United States consumes nearly 25% of the world's oil. We have less than 3% of the oil's reserves, and they're rapidly declining. We're addicted to oil, and we're at the mercy of big oil and OPEC for its price. Instead of short-sighted straw men, let's use the alternatives that we have right here at home. Alternatives like solar, wind, and geothermal energy, which are abundant in places like Nevada. Let's encourage these investments, not cut them like the Republicans' budget plan proposes. Their budget plan would drastically affect the ability to do more with renewable energy. These renewable energy sources are cleaner for our environment, wiser for our national security, and more stable for our economy. Best of all, they're made in the USA, Mr. President, and will create jobs here in our great country. The chair can now announce morning business, if it would please. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. And under the previous order, the Senate will be in a, morning, a period of morning business until 4.30 p.m. with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. <clears throat> Mr. President, the morning business time is not divided. It's under the control of whoever gets here. Is that right? The senator is correct. I would note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
In about three hours from now, the Senate is scheduled to vote on a few things, a judicial nomination, also on continuing two programs to help small high-tech and research firms. Right now, the House is in recess on the other side of the Capitol, in for votes at 6.30 Eastern Time, a couple of measures. Later on this week, members are uh, scheduled to consider another temporary spending plan, uh, the sixth spending plan, the temporary spending plan to keep the government operating while negotiations continue on funds for the rest of this budget year. Meanwhile, live right now on C-SPAN 3, uh, the American Public Transportation Association Conference with a discussion on transportation issues facing federal agencies. At the conference, uh, the heads of the Federal Railroad Administration and the Federal Transit Administration. That's live right now on C-SPAN 3. As we wait for a senator to come to the floor to speak, a couple of stories from the Associated Press. A senior Democratic spokesman says Democratic National Committee Chairman Tim Kaine told a law school class that he's likely to run for a Senate seat next year. DNC spokesman Brad Woodhouse made the announcement on Twitter today. And uh, Associated Press goes on to say that it's the most definitive statement yet from the former Virginia governor that he'll try to hold retiring Senator Jim Webb's seat for the Democrats in next year's election. Another story, an April 6th hearing date has been set in the federal antitrust lawsuit filed by players against the NFL. The players filed a request last week for an injunction that would keep the NFL and the teams from engaging in a lockout, which took effect at midnight on Friday. The hearing is scheduled to be in front of a U.S. district judge in Minnesota.
Today, President Obama uh, was in, spoke at Kenmore Middle School in Arlington, Virginia, uh, talking about the No Child Left Behind law that's been in place for about a decade. Today, uh, President Obama asked Congress to change that law, uh, largely paralleling congressional quarterly rights, the blueprint that Education Secretary Arne Duncan released almost a year ago. He called for shifting from the law's emphasis on proficiency testing in math and reading to measures that gain, gauge gains in student achievement over, the la over a year. That's in congressional quarterly.
Mr. President. The Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask um, to dispense with the reading of the roll. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'd like to speak uh, for up to 15 minutes. I understand Senator Kyle will be joining us shortly. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I come to the floor today uh, to urge my colleagues to consider voting yes on cloture this afternoon uh, at 5.30. The vote has been called to proceed to the debate on a very important federal program that comes under the jurisdiction of the Small Business Committee. I know the President has been a leader in his state um, on this general subject matter, and um, our committee has worked very hard here in the Senate and in the House, I might add, to get this program ready for reauthorization because it's the federal government's largest research program for small business. And as you know, Mr. President, and I've said many times on the floor as chair of the Small Business Committee, I really want and hope that the federal government itself could be a better partner with small businesses in America to encourage innovation, to encourage appropriate risk taking. And we can do that in a variety of different ways. Of course, we have authority over banking systems and capital systems and financial systems. We sometimes do that with just big business in mind. We need to think about the 27 million small businesses in America, giving them opportunities for capital um, through the banking system, through non-bank lenders. Our committee has been very busy trying to do our part of helping our country uh, out of this recession by continuing to focus on capital access for small business. We also keep a close eye on regulations that might be dampening uh, small businesses from growing and accelerating, whether those regulations come out of the financial sector or from health or EPA, et cetera. We try to keep an eye, and the Small Business Administration itself, in fact, has an independent agency inside of it to look at rules and regulations, and our committee is going to take a hard look at any rules and regulations coming out from any federal agencies um, that miss the mark or that fail to recognize the impact that some of those regulations may have on small business. And if it's too onerous, we are going to comment and push back. But another way that our federal government can be a better partner to small business is to make sure they have access to some of the federal government's research and development and technology funds. We think from the Department of Defense, we don't think we know, from the Department of Defense all the way to the Department of Health and Human Services, to the Department of Energy, to the Department of Commerce, the federal government spends literally billions of dollars in research and development, and that's good. Only a small percentage of our budget. Some people argue those research and development dollars are too low because with the federal government, uh, by investing in research and development wisely, really generates and promotes patents, inventions, discoveries, expansion of business, large and small. In fact, America does this probably better than any country in the world, and we're proud of it. And the federal government has a role to play. This particular program was started by Senator Rudman over 25, actually almost 30 years ago now. Senator Rudman was a senator from New Hampshire. And from a small state like New Hampshire, he was, of course, very familiar with the great universities and the great small businesses there. And he was just actually shocked and I think dismayed and saddened to find out that small businesses in his own state had really, even if they were inventing some of the best products, some of the best technologies, couldn't get their foot in the front door to an agency like the NIH. They didn't want to talk to a small business. They wanted to talk to the big pharmaceuticals or they wanted to talk, you know, to the big companies. And I think Senator Rudman got a little frustrated and so he said, you know what? I think we need to have a, a not a ceiling, but a floor for the agencies to look to the small businesses in all of our communities on main streets all over America and say, what do you have to offer and we'll give you an opportunity. And you know, this works two ways. One, it's good for small business to be able to have access to some of these research and development dollars. But Mr. Mr. President, as, as importantly, it's important for the taxpayer to get the best 
bang for their buck that they're paying in taxes. And they want the best technology, not just the easiest to access. They want the best technology. And these companies, having invested um, in this program now over 25 years, we have evidence upon evidence upon evidence to suggest that the taxpayer has, in fact, gotten the best bang for its buck. In fact, this company that I'm going to show you will prove beyond a doubt what I'm saying. This company, Qualcomm, is a very famous company now. But 25, 30 years ago, no one had ever heard of it. Qualcomm is a company based in San Diego, California. Its owner, uh, it's publicly owned now, but its founder, testified before our Small Business Committee just last week on this program, urging us to do this reauthorization, which is going to take the, the bulk of the debate on the floor this week, this particular program. He said absolutely, positively, Qualcomm would not have been able to launch as a small business that started in his den with about 35 of his friends and associates that had come up, not 35 in the beginning, but even a smaller number than that, that had come up with the initial technology that made wireless communication possible. And so with a small grant from one of our research and development programs, up to 150,000 initially, then you can go back for a second round up to a million or a third round up for another million. Without that patient capital invested very timely in this, in this particular company, uh, they would probably not have been able to make what they eventually turned out to, which is a company that contributes approximately $5.5 billion to San Diego's economy every year and pays in taxes, Mr. President, over $1 billion every year to the local, state, and federal government. That's half of the cost of this program. So one success story out of this program generates enough tax dollars to pay for almost half. And this program really doesn't cost the federal government any because we're already investing in research and development. What this program does is say you're going to push aside or set aside 2.5% of your research dollars, up to 3% over 10 years, to invest in small businesses just like Qualcomm once was in the hopes that it will develop into a large business, but even more importantly, that it will develop something that improves the quality of life for Americans and for people of the world. And most certainly now that everyone is walking around with wireless technology, using it for any number of things, staying in touch with spouses, with kids, from you know, uh, tracking threats to general business being used, we know that this technology has become now just a part of everyone's life. That is only one example. Others involved uh, the alert system for the B-52 bomber. That technology, again, came out of the SBIR program. So reauthorizing this program is something that we know is important to do to create jobs, to begin to create the kind of jobs that will lead us out of this recession. Innovation equals jobs. Technology equals jobs. Another uh, program I want to share, this one is actually from Louisiana, and there are actually success stories from every state in the union. Um, Meso Technologies has created, with the help of uh, LSU and a small business, uh, Dr. Kevin Kelly started with two employees. Now his payroll exceeds 1.2 million. They, we ran into problems, Mr. President, when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan trying to run our tanks in places that were extremely hot. The radiators that we had uh, designed were not sufficient and we were running into a serious equipment challenge. It was the small business, this small business at LSU with the help of the university that began to develop new kinds of technologies that now can be used for our military but it also has potential for significant commercial application, potentially in the race car industry or potentially in the general automotive industry. That's an example of how technologies needed for a specific problem that the federal government's having 
responded to by small business, not a big company, a small company, and new technologies can create the new ra radiators of the future. So small businesses are key to putting Americans back to work. They are the innovators. In fact, small businesses account for 13 times more patents than large businesses, and small businesses employ need almost 40% of American scientists and engineers. Studies show that SBIR-backed firms have been responsible for roughly 25% of the nation's most crucial innovations over the past decade. Unfortunately, Mr. President, and this is why I'm on the floor today, this important program that does so much to give taxpayers the full um, measure and worth of their tax dollar that gives small businesses the opportunity to grow, to create jobs right here in America, not in China, not in, um, in France or in Spain, but right here uh, in America. These, um, these programs have been sputtering. This particular program has been sputtering on short-term extensions. Every three months, we reauthorize it, or every six months, at last year's levels. We need to move forward, provide a longer-term extension. The bill that we're going to be debating this week provides an eight-year authorization, which gives some certainty. It gives some stability to the 300 labs in the United States of America that do primarily research and, invest, research and development for the federal government. It sends out a clear signal to innovators. The federal government has challenges. The federal government has problems. And now we're putting some money behind those challenges and problems. We want you to be part of the solution. We believe in this program. I want to thank particularly Senator Tom Colburn for negotiating this eight-year uh, extension. A little bit longer than a normal five, but a little bit less than some of us wanted initially at a 14-year authorization because we think long-term stability is so important uh, for these programs. The agencies have to do uh, some more work, our federal agencies, to step up their administration of this program to get even better at uh, putting out the needs of their agencies, identifying small businesses, so we want to give them the confidence that this program is actually going to last for more than two years or three years or even four. So this eight-year authorization is important. I am very proud that under my leadership and also with Senator Snow and Senator Kerry, I uh, have worked very hard together to get this bill uh, into its current form. In the very last hours of the last Congress, we were actually able to negotiate with the biotechnology industry formerly known as BIO, and the Small Business Technology Coalition. They had been basically um, at odds over some aspects of this reauthorization. And because we worked very hard and in good faith, and both sides came together, we've now achieved a compromise which has the support of the National Small Business Administration, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the NFIB, the National Venture Capital Association, local technology groups, many universities, many universities throughout uh, the country, including uh, my alma mater, Louisiana State University, Louisiana Tech, the University of, um, uh, uh, of Ohio, just to name a few. So I wanted to make sure that people understand not only some examples of what this program um, will fund in terms of Qualcomm, which was an earlier example, wireless technology, or whether it's a radiator used in our uh, military uh, equipment, both in our tanks and sometimes used in our other, other platforms. But also, this technology can be used potentially in the racing car industry. No other SBIR and STTR reauthorization bill has had the support of this many organizations this early in any Congress, uh, and the compromise is represented here in the bill that we've laid down or we will be passing uh, forward today. Um, I want to just say, Mr. Mr. President, that the agencies have been extremely cooperative, particularly the Department of Defense, um, USDA, Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Energy. They have the lion's share, Health and Human Services, 
of these research budgets. DOD, it's not an insignificant amount. It's over $1 billion. The Department of Defense will invest in small businesses to get the best technologies available, like the radiator uh, technology they need for our tanks. HHS has $615 million. It's a very small part of their total research budget, but an important part. So when they put out the challenge to small businesses in America to come up with the next newest vaccine or the next uh, medical technology or information technology that saves taxpayer money and helps provide better quality of life for all Americans, that word will go out from HHH. DOE has $150 million available to invest in small business. NASA, $125 million, just to name a few. So not only will the taxpayers benefit, but small businesses as well. Many of these advanced technologies uh, developed, uh, developed by businesses that could have started in your garage or, like, or your den without these programs. They are the brainchild of a scientist with a dream who took his or her idea to the next level and had this program to get that first 150,000, that first 1 million. So I'm urging all of my colleagues to support moving to this bill this afternoon. It passed out of the Small Business Committee last week nearly unanimously and has continued to gain large bipartisan support publicly and privately. The CBO estimates a very modest cost of $150 million over five years. We've made changes that have decreased the estimate from last year's cost of $229 million. So we have trimmed the administrative portion of this program. We believe that this $150 million is a fantastic investment for the federal government to place um, uh, research dollars in the hands of some of the best, most dynamic, most innovative entrepreneurs on the face of the earth today. We want them, we want to give them an opportunity, particularly in tight credit and capital markets, to access these uh, funds at the federal level to produce the kind of goods and services, and most importantly, jobs for the future. I see that my uh, time uh, has expired. So again, Mr. President, I look forward to coming down with my members of the Small Business Committee to talk more about this bill as the week unfolds. But again, I urge my colleagues today at 5.30 to vote yes for cloture on this important bill so that we can pass it out of the Senate today, get it over to the House as quickly as we can into the President's desk for signature. And I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.